Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Mulek and I'm the Global Director of the Achieve Project. Uh, today, we're gonna share with you information that we gathered during our implementation of the USAID Achieve Project in Tanzania. Achieve is a global project with two main objectives, to reach epidemic control in adolescents and children and pregnant and breastfeeding women and to transition implementation to capable local partners. The focus of today's webinar is to share our learnings from transitioning 300,000 participants in OBC and DREAMS activities to two local partners in Tanzania. First, we will hear from Dr. Lavina Kikoyo, our project director in Tanzania. She will present both the process for the transition and the results from an assessment that we conducted about the process. The assessment process included quantitative and qualitative methods and included respondents from community caseworkers through to the national government level. Then we will have a panel discussion with key stakeholders, including our USAID activity manager, the chief of party of Kazazi Hodari from ELCT, the president's office of regional administration and local government, Tanzania, and our own project director and our own director of CD and CSO management. We're hopeful that these insights will be helpful to others embarking on the transition process. We're appreciative of the support and the guidance of USAID during our work. So I'm gonna now hand over to Colette Peck, who is the AOR for the Achieve Project from USAID for some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Colette Peck. I'm the branch chief for the Orphans and Vulnerable Children branch in USAID's Office of HIV AIDS and also have the pleasure of serving as the AOR for the Global Achieve Mechanism. Um, I know there's lots to get through today, so I will be very brief, but I'm really excited to be here for this presentation um, on the immense work I know has gone into this local partner transition in Tanzania. It's worth noting that Tanzania is our largest, USAID's largest OBC program in terms of um, numbers of children served. So it's significant opportunity and responsibility on both for both USAID and our IPs. Um, given this is this is one of the largest OBC program transitions that has been undertaken um, to advance the localization agenda. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize the amazing work of our USA Tanzania OVC colleagues, Elizabeth Lema, Grace Saga, Linda Madaleka, and Pascal Wilbrod, as well as Sarah Daster as our HQ Tanzania backstop for all their leadership in planning, supporting, and overseeing a responsible phased um, transition. I'm sure this will be discussed further, but um, wanted to note that you know one of the important steps in this process was having a foundational transition workshop in Arusha, um, where USAID and IPs were working together to lay out respective roles, responsibilities, expectations, and importantly, committing to taking a one team approach that puts um, at the forefront the best interests of children and families to ensure that we can continue uninterrupted high quality OVC service delivery. So a big thanks also to just all of the, the partners, um, government counterparts and these teams for all of the efforts which resulted in Tanzania's continued excellent OVC program performance. Um, and that is importantly improving health protection and other well-being outcomes among OVC and their families across 125 councils in Tanzania. So thanks to Achieve for putting this together, really looking forward to this opportunity to share lessons learned and good practices as we at USAID continue to advance the localization agenda in our OBC programming and beyond across other countries. Um, thanks so much. Am I turning over to uh, Lavina or back to you, Jen? Um, we're turning over to Cynthia. Cynthia, did you want to start uh, Lavina's presentation, please? Yes, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cynthia Abiambo. I am the Capacity Development Advisor um, for the Achieve Project. I would like to um, introduce Levina Kyoko, who is the Achieve, um, uh, the Project Director of Achieve Tanzania um, to do the presentation. Levina, as you introduce yourself, I'll put your slide on. Thank you so much. Cynthia, good afternoon, good morning, colleague. As introduced, I'm Dr. Levina Kikoyo. I'm a chief project director in Tanzania, as well as practicant director. 
And so um, as uh, Cynthia tries to put my slide. Yeah, just a second. Sorry, Levina, you can go ahead as I uh, put it on. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so when you are done, you can let me know if uh, uh, I'm able to see it. But today I'll be sharing with you Achieve Tanzania Transitioning OVC Service and the dreams um, transitioning to national prime implementing partner. And so let me try to wait a little bit to see if since is able to share. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Uh... Can somebody confirm you are able to see the slides now? Put it on sure. slide mode, yeah. uh, Cynthia, then I can go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, next, please. So in this presentation, I will share with you um, the transition process that will include our local partner, uh, the local partner journey but also the transition process uh, will be sharing with you the timelines and milestones, the capacity development um, tasks that we have been conducting, but also we thought it would be good for you to hear our transition documentation methodology. On the other part, I will share with you the transition experience that include the key results, challenges and lessons learned, and also mm -hmm. I'll be sharing with you insights for future transition. Next. Um, so this is our local partner journey, um, really uh, the experience that we use in PACT. And for us, the first step, very important one, is engaging the partner and really building that relationship and making sure that we are in the same, on the same page. And the second part is um, uh, analysis and uh, planning. We work together with the partner, but this is the area where we conduct the pre-award assessment to ensure that we, we identify together the key issues that we want to address. And at this point, also, we use different tools, but the key important ones uh, as a implement of USAID, we use USAID approved tools that includes NUPAS and the OPI. And the fourth is uh, steps uh, is implementation. This is done after the pre-award um, after the pre-assessment where we identify capacity action plan together and we agreed on how we are going to be to implement that. So in the third step, we work together. And for us as, um, as a, a, a partner, we support the, the local partner or the sort of say national implementing partner to ensure that the capacity action plan agreed are being implemented. After some times, in most cases, after one year, uh, we do evaluation. During this evaluation, we use the same tools that we use at the beginning, and we use the same questions and to see how far they have gone. So for the national implementing partner at this point, that's where we go to step number five and where we can advise now if they have uh, performed or scored up to three, the highest score is four, then we can uh, propose to USAID, for instance, that this partner is ready. If not, then uh, we will continue to build the capacity. But for those organizations, for instance, where you will hear today, like ELOCT, um, at this point, we continue to work with them because by then they will have already started to implement the project if they had been selected by USAID from the beginning. And that take us to the uh, next stage, which is post-transition phase, where we continue to work with the partner to ensure that they are able to master each and everything of what we are, we are, we are, we are doing. Next. So today we wanted to share with you the practical part of achieve transition process in Tanzania and achieve project. Um, so our approach has been a, a, a phased approach to transitioning of this uh, orphan and vulnerable children program uh, to two local national prime implementing partners. And so for us, um, we use 
national prime implementing partners instead of local. Our partner here like more to be called the national partners than uh, being called the local. So you will hear more, me more talking about the national prime implementing partners. And so for us to achieve, we had transitioned to two national prime implementing partners. We had our Deloitte and the ELCT, and the today you will, you, will be, you will be able also to hear the lecture from our partner who is Deloitte. And why do um, why do we do this phased approach? Is to ensure that there is no interruption of services to orphan vulnerable children and on the dreams beneficiaries, but also is to maintain deliver of quality services while attaining uh, annual target on the key PEFA and the customer indicators. And in this case, it's OVC and the dreams beneficiaries. You will see this small table which shows the phase approach, phase one, two, and uh, three. And at this point, I want to acknowledge you and again say thank you to USAID because really we worked together from the beginning, discussed and uh, with their guidance, but also really getting our suggestions, we ended up having this phase approach. At the beginning, it was a different setup, but we had this to make sure that the rationale or the agreed objective of no interruption to services and ensuring quality services are being met. So to date, we have transitioned um, uh, around 299,000 uh, orphans and vulnerable children to these two national local implementing partners, and these are in 69 councils. However, Achieve continue also to work directly in 41 councils. So we continue to work together, learning together, addressing the issue together, ensuring that the orphans and vulnerable children in Tanzania and the USAID funding of uh, full uh, reporting, uh, getting all the, the services that they are supposed to get. Next. So um, we wanted also to share with you uh, the transition timeline and the milestones. And this is just coming from our learning that the, the pre-transition uh, pre uh, phase and which we estimate that it should take between three to six months before the national plan uh, implementing partner starts. Uh, some of the major activities are listed there, but key important ones is to make sure that the community, the beneficiary and the government counterparts understand that there will be that change, but also to update the project information. There should be staff recruitment on the other side, but again, that's also part of the capacity uh, assessment, getting project information, but also for the national plan implementing partners to issue the RIFA, and they select the partner, do the sub award assessment, and more importantly, to develop the work plan and the budget uh, through the co creation. After um, the transition, after the, the start date of the, the partner now that they have started, we also think it should take around six to 12 months. And really, the key part on the activities include sharing of the project information, transfer management of implementation but provide the required technical support. And I think that's where there is also most of the work that we, you, you know, we, we have to ensure that the partner have all the, the information they want, but also the sub award closing on our side because you are transitioning. That means in those areas, you have to close and the new partner has to start up. But also that's the part where we do a lot of capacity building through coaching and mentoring and also implementing a peer-to-peer -peer coaching and mentoring program uh, while ensuring strengthening uh, the donor engagement. But again, even after you have done the transition, there is this major part that remain, which is post-transitioning phase. And this, again, it, it depends really on the partner that has taken on board uh, the responsibilities for us. We think it should really, really a minimum of 12 months, but it can still go to, tw to 36 um, months, so to say three years. And some major activities which we continue even to do today with our partner is to have joint monitoring of the activities uh, in implementing and in service delivery, but also to continue strengthening the leadership and the management on OVC uh, programming. And in between, we have learned that there are also demand-driven capacity, uh, capacity strengthening and technical support, depending on the program implementation. So you need to continue providing assistance to the institution on a peer-to-peer coaching and mentorship. Of important, again, you need to continue strengthen the network, 
and then the capacity reassessment, as I will explain later, and what has made us also do well with our two national prime implementing partner is having a joint program review where we share the experience, best practice, and lessons learned. And for that, again, I want to appreciate the support that you have been receiving from USAID in the, even being part of our joint program review meeting to make sure that we are on the same page. Next. And so um, this is uh, the action chain, just to share with you a little bit with the focus on our current achieve for, uh, where we did, uh, we, we have worked with the Kizazi Hodari, the new national prime implementing partner. At the beginning, as I said, as a second step, we did uh, the assessment and the, during the assessment, we identified together some gaps. And so together with the partner, we developed the capacity action plan where the partner have to to uh, to implement that was in 2022, and by then we identified 69 capacity action plan. But at the end of FY 2023, uh, 97 percent had already uh, addressed. And as I speak today, all the capacity capacity action plan has been um, identified, and so very successful that everything has been done. So what we did um, on our part again, in addition to the other issues that I have already mentioned, we had we shared and oriented them on the use of tools and the systems. Those tools ranges on different things, including the monitoring and evaluation tool, the gender-based violence tool, the dreams and so forth, but also introdu introducing our partner, our, the national prime implementing partners and linking them to our global um, TA providers. Um, as you know, Achieve is a global, and so we had the partners who are providing technical assistance. And so we noted again as they were continuing to implement, they needed the same support, and we made sure that we 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 engaged them, we we connected them with the features without violence, the no means no, and the black. But also we continued to support them in terms of reviewing and in the development of the strategic plans reviewing the documents, the policies like procurement, human resource management, finance, and subaward management. And the, really, these activities depends on the individual need of the partner. So it's not like a stone cut. It is related to what the partner need during that time, especially during the assessment. And our main approach is um, coaching and mentorship approach, which is really very, uh, has helped us. Because as we continue to provide the capacity um, development to national implement national um, prime implementing partner. We also continue to provide the services, so we needed to balance in terms of staffing the level of effort and the technical um, aspect that is needed. So using coaching and mentoring approach has helped us also to move faster and also to ensure that the partner also are adapting and understanding each of what we can do together. Next. And so uh, having shared that, we thought it would be um, of value for you to hear about our documentation assessment and the methodology we have used to be able to document this transition process. And so in between, you will see focus group discussion, project document review, quantitative survey, and the technical validation workshop. These are the key methodology that we have used to ensure that we capture the information, the views, or the views that inform the national prime implementing partners. So we had four focus group discussion. We engaged 60 uh, community case workers here written as a CCW, but also the key partner, uh, the national implementing partner. So here you will hear me talking about national implementing partner. These are the usual local partner who are you know subgranted by us or by any other partner but when i say national implement national prime implementing partner these are the ones who have been transitioned so also those ones were key but also achieve team uh, and also a, an important aspect to important partner are the government counterparts in which we engaged like 10 in 10 regions and we had like 32 um where we had the 32 councils uh, transitioned by then. So in terms of the, um, the, the respondents, we had respondents from national implementing partners and national prime implementing partners in 87, but also we had very important from the government counterparts, from the regional 
um, regional manager from the regional social welfare, LIMOs and DMOs. These are important because these are the ones who are really uh, in the, uh, supporting the community, but also the owner would say of what we implement. So we heard from all of those, but also in terms of the documentation, we looked into our previous plan on the transition plan, the weekly um, check-in meeting that we had had, and also the reports that we had produced. Of importance during the, tech, uh, the technical validation workshop, which was instrumental um, during this process to ensure the findings and the provision of detail that to ensure that we have the, the information that really validate the, the information that we, we collected from the survey and from focus group discussion. So we had really a, a team of people from USAID, from our self achieve Tanzania, but also from USAID because Odari, who are the national prime implementing partners. We had also the transitioned national implementing partner, the sub grantee to Kizazi Hodari and the government at the high level and again, the government at the local level. These are really the participants and the leaders that I'm going to share soon are the leaders also of all these people who participated during the transition process. Next. And so these are some of the key leaders that we, we picked. Uh, what we see the, the transition process uh, took uh, around 18 months and for us we have transitioned um, the service delivery and dreams uh, in 18 uh, regions uh, with 69 councils, as, as already said, but also over 299,000 orphans and vulnerable children has been transitioned to date. And the 14 national implementing partners, the local sub grantee has been transitioned to date. So, what did we hear uh, from our from the people who were engaged as we were evaluating and documenting the transition, 69% of national implementing partners and the national prime implementing partners responded that, uh, that there was a high involvement uh, of, of most of the people during the transition process. Because we wanted to, to hear their views, whether the transition process went well, were they informed, did they understand it? So 69% um, responded that they really understood. But uh, the next part is the achieve staff. So for achieve staff, they thought all important stakeholders in the implementation of uh, the in provision of service delivery and the dreams, like 89% were involved at the regional level, which means from the government counterparts, 93%, they thought we did. Uh, we did uh, uh, well in terms of engaging them, involving them, and understanding the transition process. So another note, of course, was also to look into sustainability because that transition could happen now and in the future. And so we did uh, uh, transfer also the case files of the children that we are saving from the from achieved projects, so to say, to the government at the local government authority. So this is a percent of the case files that we transferred. But on the importance of transitioning planning, 83% um, of the respondents felt that we did well in terms of the planning process. But in terms of capacity development from our now Kizazi Odari um, partners, the national plan implementing partners, 90% of the respondents thought that they received the capacity that they needed to continue with the implementation. And the key point in implementing the project is the strategic information, so to say the monitoring and evaluation. And so we had 71% of the national climate implementing partner and the national implementing partners had the feeling that we did well in terms of giving them the technical support that they, that they needed on managing the information. And so Achieve really shared the data collection tool, the service delivery tool, the standard operation procedure, and including really training them on the system, including the beneficial enrollment management system, DHIS2, USSD, and the defining clearly all perfect indicators to make sure that the new partner now have understanding they are able to, man to, to monitor and to ensure that they are achieved. Next. So quickly, these are the challenge and that the pre-transition, uh, during the transition and the post-transition. 
timing always i think we know even training that is always not enough we think it should really the pre pre transition should take six months but for us it took um uh, three months, but again, to appreciate that we had all the support from USAID and so everything was made possible. Uh, during the transition process, uh, there was imaging capacity development needs and that really require more time, money, power and the financial resources. And sometimes you can't uh, you know, identify those before you see them as they come and so you have to manage that. In terms of um, the capacity building needs, also, there were uh, some gaps that were not covered during the initial assessment, and so they come after you start the implementation, but also competing priorities, because now both national implementing partners and the ASEA chief, we had still to deliver and to meet the objective to reach the number of the, the, the beneficiaries, but again, there is the capacity uh, development need. So sometimes competing priorities, but the key things is how we work together, how we communicate, and still manage the process. And this one thing also we learned is a few of one known among the other stakeholders. Um, so because when you when we started, we informed them this is the achieve, this is how we work. And so the by saying this new partner is coming, there were different questions like a bit confusing and why the new partner are they going to provide the same support that you provide? But again. Uh, through the communication, through working together with the partner, going there together in some areas, uh, introducing them and really talking about really why this transition is happening and what is the net of that has helped us still to move forward and to do well uh, to date as we still work together uh, in providing these services. Next. So um, again, the lessons learned are uh, very clear that the transition process is non-linear and it is really a learning process, not just for national implementing partner, but for both. For us, for instance, practice with the ACHIEVE, it's a learning, but also for Kizazodali, it's a learning. And I want to believe also that this is also for USAID taking some lessons also from us, but also we believe that we have seen that transition is a participatory process, really a paramount of importance to involve all stakeholders so that you are on the same page. I think I have one more last slide. And so these are insights for future transitioning. And these are some of the experience that we have seen. And we would propose if one wants to do the transitioning, could be important to consider. Clear communication and the stakeholders engagement strategy needed to be in place as you plan for transition process. But also one need to provide a strategic um, financial planning to foster sustainable institutions because when you do the transition, really the partner receiving needed to have the capacity in place. And sometimes you have to budget really for that capacity development for the staff and for the institution. Uh, engaging local stakeholders through co-creation and the capacity development, an important aspect in during the transition process so that everyone understand clearly what the, that means and what are different roles that each one is going to play. Government collaboration for sustainable impact. If there is something that we do well in Tanzania for us to achieve with everything we do, we recognize and we understand that we complement government efforts. So once you are on the transition process, you need to let the government know from the beginning. For us, we are successful because we had the support from the government after they had understood USAID was in the front. And so today we continue to implement together with the national prime implementing partners because of this collaboration that we had during the process. But also um, the recruitment for national implementing partners needed to be early, as I said, so that also they have time to prepare. The pre-planning is very important. And so before the, the actual transition, uh, enough time, at least not less than three months, we think uh, would be important to make the transition work out. An important aspect is to clearly define the roles of each partner. And again, I'm sorry I have mentioned this several times on uh, us appreciating USAID, but we felt it from the beginning that they gave us enough time to really sit with us to listen and, and the correct has said clearly that the initial meeting that brought us together provided us clear 
uh, roadmap on how are we going to work, what are the roles of each partner, because you are also, you have a lot of priorities, so it has to be clear who is achieving that, who is achieving that target, what is the specific role of this partner and this partner. And once you are very clear, it, it makes very well. For us, we went ahead even having the memorandum of understanding so that at the end of the day, every partner is very clear on what is responsible for. With that, I want again to say thank you so much for listening. And that makes the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Levina. Um, and thank you so much for the questions and um, that are already on the chat. Um, Levina will um, answer these questions during our, uh, our question and answer session. And uh, thank you so much, Levina, again, for the comprehensive summary of some of the learnings um, and experiences that we have had um, from uh, the documentation of the transition process in Achieve Tanzania. Well, we've gotten to the heart of, of this webinar um, uh, for our panel um, discussion, and I will request our panelists to have their video on. Um, for this session um, um, as we delve into um, the discussion. Um, Levina has uh, really contextualized and uh, given us um, a comprehensive summary of what um, happened uh, during the, what was documented in the transition process. And now we want to move on to our panelists, our diverse panelists to really discuss and get further insight into really how this transition process uh, more than the taken and what their experiences were. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Elizabeth Lema. Um, Elizabeth Lema is the program management specialist um, from USA, Tanzania. Um, we have Godson Maro, who's the chief of party um, for the Kizazi Hodari Northern Eastern activity that is being implemented by ELCT. Our third um, um, uh, panelist is Agostino Mashinga, who is the Director of Capacity Development and Civil Society Management um, at Achieve Tanzania. And lastly, we have Nikinda Shegagale, who is the Pro Principal Social Welfare Officer from the President Office Regional Administration and Local Government, basically the government of Tanzania. And we want to really thank them for this opportunity that they've given unto us to have this discussion um, um, in, uh, during this webinar. To start us off, um, Elizabeth, um, onto the first question. Um, could you elaborate, um, Elizabeth, on USAID's approach um, in supporting local partners to, you know, um, in, into their transition planning for development initiative? And in particular, in this case, um, you know, OVC services and dreams programming. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone who is in the DC and good afternoon to my fellows who are in African countries. How are you? So thank you very much. I'm really happy to be part of this discussion. And I'm happy because I've been part of this transition team and I've learned a lot and first of all I just want to tell everybody that in order to make sure that this transition goes well every team member should be committed so I really appreciate the commitment that we have got from Achieve to make it happen as well as the local partners and the support we had from our HQ as well as the government counterpart. Now Sorry, since they're going can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but you're facing, um, I think you need to face your second screen. Um, oh, okay. we, yeah, we this can one? see you from Can you side. see me now? Uh, maybe it's... Perfect, yes. You now can see me can now. See no, just go back the way you are. Sorry, Elizabeth. Yes, like that. We can see you. You can see me now. Yes, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. So did you hear what I've said? Yes, we did hear what you said. I <laughs> want to interrupt your introduction, so go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So as the USAID do set some internal reforms to ensure that our works put local partners in lead. We are also working to strengthen the local systems so that they will be responsible to make sure that we achieve our goal of sustainability. And specifically on the localization strategy, 
USAID ensure that we, we provide at least a quarter of all our programs fund, funds directly to the local partners. And we have this goal by FY 2025. But also we have set steps to ensure that by 2030, at least 50% of our programming will be placed local communities in the, in the lead of core design of a project, set priorities, drive implementation, and or evaluate the impact of our programs. So we are really up to localization. But second, we want to make sure that we advance localization by pursuing several strategies, and that including uh, adapting our policies and program practices that foster local sustained change that is tied to each country, unique political, social, cultural, economic, and environmental conditions while targeting the drivers of and barriers of change. But second, what we are doing in terms of um, advancing localization, we are really advocating for the shift of power to local actors. And this, we want to make sure that they, are, they, they have a meaningful seat at the table. But also through localization, we, made, we, are, we want to make sure that we are integrating diversified groups to make sure that we have their voices in whatever we are doing in our programs. And then thirdly, we are, channel, we are trying to channel a large portion of assistance directly to credible local partners while ensuring accountability for the appropriate use of funds and the achievement of development and humanitarian results. And then lastly, we serve as public advocate and thought leader at the global and country level using our convening authorities, partnership, voice, and the power of, for example, to catalyze a broader shift to local lead development. So these are the few I can be able to mention for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, if I could just ask another question from what you've just said around you know, credible local uh, partners. Uh, also, how does USAID support local partners to assess their readiness um, in assuming responsibility uh, for transition programs and services? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. We do have specific activities that we are doing, that including capacity assessment, and we have different tools that we are using, like in UPRAS. I think even Achieve have mentioned about that. But also, we are working to facilitate and support transitioning and uh, transitioning and mon monitoring of the activities, just like what we have done in this process. But also, we have different interventions that, including, we do regular review on the progress made in achieving their objective and their adherence to USAID and their organization policies. Thank you, Cynthia. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I want to encourage our participants who have joined us to, you know, give in their questions on the uh, question and answer uh, chat. And please um, feel free to also indicate if you need a particular panelist to respond to that question. Um, I'd like to go to our second panelist, um, to um, Agostino, um, and to ask Agostino, based on, um, you know, our role as Achieve, um, you know, that has, has played in building capacity, and we've heard that a lot from even Levina. Um, you know, how do we, what, what role does such a mechanism, um, such as Achieve, um, play in, con in supporting, you know, the continued um, um, local partners, um, capacity development support to actually transit, um, you know, through the different phases? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for a question. So my name again is Agustino Mwashigi. I'm the Director for Capacity Development and uh, CSO Management. And actually, I was the focal person for the transition process. Uh, so a uh, mechanism like Achieve uh, has uh, major, four major roles to play in the transition process. And uh, the first role is the actual uh, transition planning. So... As you, are, you might be aware, uh, the transition process involves uh, a number of uh, stakeholders and participants. So it is uh, very critical and important to have uh, a joint plan 
that will lead and guide uh, all the stakeholders involved in the transitioning process. So after USAID has introduced uh, Kizazi Odari National Prime Implementing Partners, then Achieve as a global mechanism spearheaded uh, the development of the transition plan so that uh, well, the plan which identified basically the key transition activities, uh, milestones, and uh, timelines for implementing those uh, activities. But uh, we had uh, also time to uh, clearly define laws and responsibilities for each uh, stakeholder that has, uh, has been involved in the transition process. So that was one. And uh, second uh, was the coordination and the monitoring law. So as we had already a plan, our joint plan in that in place, so Achieve took uh, uh, a law to coordinate other partners to make sure that we implement all the agreed uh, activities and uh, to make sure that uh, each and every partner in the transition, in the transition process um, fulfills uh, or delivers uh, what was expected from the transition plan. So it was important for us to make sure that at least we coordinate and uh, we monitor the implementation process. In this case, I can give an example where we had a lot of platforms to make sure that uh, we coordinate and also we monitor the implementation uh, of the transition plan. For instance, we had a weekly check-in meeting where all the uh, stakeholders, the like National Prime Implementing Partners and the Chief uh, set uh, on a weekly basis to review the implementation progress and uh, to share the experience uh, to share the challenges and how this uh, were addressed. And if there were emerging issues that needed uh, more capacity development from uh, the side of Achieve, then we could discuss uh, the kind of uh, technical support that was, was needed and how that could be provided. So that was, you can imagine that we have, we were meeting on the weekly basis to assess and to monitor the implementation plan. But uh, uh, that was like an internal uh, meeting with the partners. But also on monthly, uh, on monthly, we had uh, a program review meeting where we invited USAID and PEFA to participate, where we also provided um, update on the transition and how we progress well, uh, well and what are the challenges we met. And if there's any need of support from USAID or a PEFA uh, in the transition process, then from there, the share and also get uh, support from our colleague from USAID. And uh, that was second. The third law that we played was uh, capacity development. So as you are, as uh, Levina said in the presentation, um, in the lo uh, local uh, transition journey, uh, we had to do the assessment of the uh, local and uh, the national implementing partners uh, to see what are the capacity gaps. And then uh, we worked it together to identify uh, the capacity action plan and how this will be addressed. So Achieve as a global mechanism uh, played a very important role to support and facilitate these national prime implementing partners uh, to, to, to address uh, these kind of uh, uh, gaps. And uh, we used our approach, as you uh, saw from the Levina's presentation, the coaching and mentorship uh, approach, where we had the four uh, uh, four stages to, 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 to deliver and transfer knowledge and skills to our national prime uh, implementing partners. But apart from that, we also organized a tailor-made training uh, to the national prime implementing partners to make sure that we address uh, the uh, challenges uh, on knowledge in terms of um, um, case management, or dreams, services provision, uh, whatever the challenge they get that tool uh, we saw from the, uh, the, the the assessment. And that notice like uh, in the course of implementing the program, there are emerging capacity needs, but still we were able to either address directly uh, those uh, capacity gap and whenever we did have the same capacity internal, uh, we linked the national program implementing partners to external uh, CD partners. That was uh, the third law. But the fourth one was uh, to ensure that there is continuity of services. As you know, in the transition process, uh, there are also a number of activities that we need to implement. But uh, at the same time, we have to ensure that the beneficiaries continue to receive the services. And not only to receive the services, but the services they receive, they are in the same quality of services that is expected. So we played a big role to make sure that uh, there's no interruption of services to, the, to beneficiaries. And the quality of services that is being provided is at the same level of the quality that is uh, expected. And in this case, I can give uh, an example. For instance, where we are uh, doing the transition of um, uh, community caseworkers, the CCW, 
this is a these are the people who are working directly with the household. They provide services to the uh, to the beneficiaries, uh, the comprehensive case management services. And for them to be able to provide the quality and consistent services, uh, we do have a monthly in-service training to them, but we also uh, pay them a, a stipend that motivates them to uh, go to the household to visit. So during the transition process, we have to make sure that uh, the national primary implementing partners, they have in place a system before we transition this group of people to them, a system to continue providing an in-service training to the CSW, but they have also a system in place to make sure that they will pay uh, the stipend in the following month uh, so that they don't, they don't interrupt uh, the CSW interaction with the household. So this is how uh, we did uh, to make sure that there is no interruption of services. Mm -hmm. At this point, it should be uh, important to note for us that uh, a transition, uh, it's not transition process, it's just not a one-time activity, but it is a process that requires time, requires investment in planning. Uh, so achieve basically invested to make sure that we plan. And uh, we want uh, and to make sure that there is no, it is uh, uh, it's continue. And then we did it uh, in three phases, where we have the pre-transition phase, as Davina has pre uh, presented, where we uh, spend a lot of time to plan the transition process. But we do the actual transition of activities, but there's also a number of activities that are, uh, we did after the uh, transition uh, process. And uh, the way we also wanted to approach the transition, we did it bit by bit. We transitioned six and nine councils, but not at a time. So we started uh, slowly uh, with small councils. The first phase was eight councils, and uh, we chose tiny councils with small target, so that the national primary implementing partners will learn the process, will learn how to manage the OVC, will learn how to manage the services, and then we transition more uh, councils as they get experience and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agostino, and thank you for, for that. And I think this is a good segue to bring in Godson. Um, you know, Agostino has really um, explained comprehensively um, the capacity development support and technical assistance that was provided. And I wanted to wanted to hear your experience in receiving all these different support and how this support has really enhanced and supported um, the transition process. Um, you know, of you know, definitely of OVC services and and Dreams program. Over to you, Godson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Agustino um, covered quite a lot in terms of comprehensively how did the capacity building actually support the transition. And I would like to start by saying that, uh, that the main success factor for this transition is willingness and readiness for both um, local implement partner as, as ELCT, as well as uh, uh, the international uh, partner uh, to build capacity to, to the local organization. So um, PACT had a capacity building program even before the start of transition. So during this transitioning period, that's the time when uh, it helped a lot to build on the already progress which has been made. So there were integrated technical and organizational capacity assessment, ITOCA, uh, which shared experience and lesson learned and best practices. And also the technical assistant, uh, which actually uh, continued from PACT to the national implementing partners. Uh, we had a lot of couple training, peer learning, coaching and mentorship, and a lot of consultation on uh, how to do some of kind, some kind of implementation. Uh, there was a uh, sharing of um, uh, working tools and job weights, uh, as well as uh, the best practices. As Agustino mentioned, we, we started uh, slowly with two councils and then uh, followed up with four council and then followed up with 26 councils and now we are on 41 councils. And this has been a step-by-step, -step, a step-by-step -step process where uh, currently we, we, we do implementation uh, with more of best uh, practice learning, but initially we started with uh, a number of uh, uh, trainings and uh, uh, coaching. So uh, I will say at least we were not quite new to PACT and that also helped a lot in, in this capacity building. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Godson. Um, so what would you say would be, you know, the contribution in enhancing your organization, considering the fact that you've been receiving this capacity development support and technical assistance from PACT? Um, what would you say it contributed in enhancing your readiness and effectiveness of assuming, um, you know, program responsibilities? So uh, we we had uh, the ITOC assessment, which actually addressed the immediate capacity development needs. And this included our um, uh, staff training, awareness of policies, key policies, but also uh, key tools which can be used uh, in, in implementing the OVC program. And uh, they reduced, uh, to, the, to the greater extent, the learning curve made uh, by by the smooth transitioning and, and capacity building. The enhancement of a uh, strategic information unit was really, really key. Uh, as you can see, uh, starting from where we were as implementing the program in only two councils and uh, uh, growing up to the larger area where we have to a large volume of, of program data, this was key. That's the area where also uh, actually packed and achieved uh, to be specific were very helpful. And then uh, there are more and more gui guidances on, on various areas, including resource allocation in various areas. Those was like the, the very key in, in, in developing the, the organization to be able to take over and implement without service interaction, interruption. Thank you. Thank you so much, Godson. Um, over to our last um, panelist, um, Mama Nikinda. Um, if you could put your video on. And um, wanted to also understand from, you know, as a representative of the uh, government of Tanzania, um, how does, you know, uh, the government of Tanzania ensure the continuity of services and sustainability of development issues, and, and especially during the transition process? Okay, thank you. Thank you, my dear. Good morning, USAID. Good afternoon, Tanzania and the other Africans. Again, my name is Nkinda Shekarage, a social worker or social welfare officer working at President Office, Regional Administration, and the local government. Coordinating, I have coordinating a lot of things, but coordinating most vulnerable children in Tanzania. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. As we know that international part, international partners and national partners complement the government effort. We know that. And their intention and in the intervention guide by government policies and guidelines. And we as a government, core business is to create good environment and also to, build, to develop policies and also to develop uh, guidelines. But also we have uh, government structures, which all partners adhere to use those guidelines and also those structures. But during development, developing this uh, guideline, we, on, we involve uh, development partners, whether it is uh, international or local, local partners. We involve such as uh, PACT Achieve. We develop a lot of uh, policies, but to mention a few, we have a guideline which is called GAS, you know GAS. GAS means Gender Equality and the Social Inclusion Guide. Also, we have CC SOAP, which is comprehensive uh, cancer social welfare operational plan, which also all activities which involve social welfare services are planned to that is, uh, systems. But also we involve in, in developing a community-based health program. This is a guide. And also we, uh, we involve in developing MVC supportive supervision guide. We have MVC identification, but also we have MVC support supervision guide. All involve our partners as each. A lot is uh, achieved. In sustainability also, uh, as a government, we, we allocate some of funds, even though we have partners and we have no partners, but we as a government, we have allocation of funds funds from different sources. We have, we have our own sources, but also we have our partners who can, we can uh, allocate some of their funds. So in sustainability, 
our, our government also, they allocate their funds. But also, we as government, uh, we invested more in training and the equipment of prof professionals, such as social affairs professionals from all levels, at regional levels, council level, and also we have those for volunteers at the community level. And also we have a, a very strong uh, coordination. To maintain sustainability, we, have, we must have a coordination. So we have a, a strong coordination in the government. For instance, me here as a kinder, I coordinate uh, achieve program or achieve project. So this uh, uh, coordination make us to win, uh, uh, to have to have sustainability of intervention of a, a lot of uh, activities. Also, uh, in we maintain also we maintain sustainability by having those uh, professionals by having allocation of funds, also by having guidelines and policies. By doing so, all uh, uh, international partners, all local partners can adhere using those uh, guidelines and maintain and its sustainability of activity, the activities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roman Kinda. I really appreciate your, um, your, your points around how the government of Tanzania has been um, providing support to ensure sustainability of our initiatives. Um, due to time, I would um, ask that we, um, I can, and I can only also see that a lot of the questions have been provided, responses by our team. I want to thank Jane, Levina, and Jackie for responding to all the questions that are on the chat. Um, I want to take this opportunity to, you know, thank. Um, each and every participant who has joined us um, as we come to an end, we only have three minutes. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to close this um, webinar and uh, to say we are really grateful for your participation. It has been a very productive session, um, you know, having the different panelists speaking about uh, the transition process, um, the different um, initiatives and activities that were involved into the process um, I want to thank um, Colette, um, to thank Elizabeth from USAID, also giving their thoughts on how this process um, uh, um, went about. Um, for now, I will request participants who are also interested to hear much more in terms of what we did. Um, if you have any more questions, to feel free to reach out to us as ACHIEVE um, um, through PACT, um, and we will be um, happy to answer any question that um, you will you will like us to answer. Otherwise, I want to say thank you so much and really appreciate um, you taking time to spend the hour with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tensia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.